Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 372, featuring the fourth installment of my interview with the, Mr. <laughs> with the Major uh, David Wesley. This part of the interview, we talk about that uh, little system called the Coleco Atom. Uh, it didn't turn out <laughs> to be the, uh, the groundbreaking uh, computer that it was supposed to be. A lot of hype around it. And uh, uh, David gives us a really good look at the sort of behind the scenes shenanigans that were responsible for the flaws in that system and the ultimate failure of uh, Coleco as a company. Uh, we also talk about the Super Zaxxon game that his company made for it, which is actually a, a great uh, technological achievement. Uh, let's see what else in here. We also talk about a game called uh, uh, Aztec Empire of Blood, uh, which would have been a really dark uh, and very historically based. Uh, civilization sort of spin-off uh, game. Uh, didn't quite pan out, but still great stories there. And we also talk a little bit about uh, Janelle Jaquez there at the end and her uh, expertise not only as an artist but as a, uh, a computer artist, I guess. Uh, anyway, a lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Major David Wesley. Yeah, I know there's a lot of uh, viewers of the show that are big fans of the Coleco Atom. I know you've got a lot of experience, uh, yeah. good and bad, yeah. I suppose, uh, with that system. Well, I mean, it seems it seems a little strange, maybe, to some younger viewers of this to think that back then the con it was like sort of a marketing push to make a console that was also had computer yeah. functionalities, right? I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, we had by that point come to where there were some pretty nice home computer systems on the market, and um, IBM had announced that it was going to bring out a home computer system. And everyone was holding their breath to see what was going to happen. And at the same time, um, Apple already had home computer systems. And typically, these would cost you about $1,000 for the computer with a keyboard, and then $500 for a floppy disk drive, and then another $500 to $1,000 for a reasonably nice printer that would attach to it. And when you had that set up, oh, and then you spent another 1000 bucks, or another, probably another 500 bucks to get a color monitor to go on it. Um, some people cut corners and they would arrange to have an adapt adaption that you'd plug in. Apple did, in fact, you would have plugged to an existing color television set. Graphics were not therefore as neat as they could be, but they were generally fine as far as everybody else was concerned because that was the television set with the quality you were used to seeing on television. Mm -hmm. When you had that setup, which is running you about $2,500, if I've added it up in my head right, um, you can now sit down and do word processing on it. And they had pretty good word processing software on them. Or if you really want to do a lot of word processing, you could give IBM $7,000 for a professional word processor system that would have a faster printer and give you a whole bunch of different font choices and do a lot of other much classier looking stuff, which nowadays we take for granted in Word. But in those days, you know, if you didn't want to just have one fixed font that was a little clunky looking, you went up to about 7000 bucks to get the really nice stuff. Um, but Apple was doing good off all the people who were happy to have a, a, a word processor system that they could use to do form letters for their church or whatever. And all they could do was put letters on paper. They didn't have fancy headings or anything, but it was much better than doing the same thing with your old royal manual typewriter in your fingers. Um, Coleco came up with his brainstorm. They were going to move from the highly successful video game business and into the computer business. And they were going to come out with the least expensive word processor capable computer on the market. It was going to be able to play all of the ColecoVision games. It was going to be able to play bigger and more sophisticated games that were written just for it. And it was going to have, when you bought the system for only 600 bucks, you were going to get the console unit that had the computer in it and that you plugged cartridges into. The, um, cables to connect it to your home television set, and a printer, a daisy wheel printer, which were not noted for their high speed, but which, because you could snap one daisy wheel out and put another one in, mm -hmm. you could actually 
do things in different fonts, provided you use the same font for the whole document, or you printed half of it and then took out the daisy wheel. And, you know, there'd be ways you could do cute stuff with it. In any case, it would only print at 120 words a minute, which is insanely slow compared to what a professional $7,000 word processor from IBM would do, and was quite slow compared to what $2,500 worth of stuff from Apple would do with a dot matrix printer. But it was still printing stuff faster than almost anyone could type. So it was really good for the casual <coughs> home user or the church secretary or something like mm -hmm. right? that. And the whole deal's only going to cost you 600 bucks. Sounds now, great. Yeah. They are going to they're going to bottom feed this thing, right? They want to be the Model T of this industry. That's where the money is to be made. <coughs> they announced they're going to have it out by Christmas. And they get the project going. And they, we are working on the new improved versions of the ColecoVision games to go on it. And so we're... Super Zaxxon. Yeah, Super Zaxxon and Super Subrock. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we already worked on Zaxxon and Subrock and Tarzan and Pepper 2 and uh, Spy Hunter for them for the ColecoVision. And I'm trying to, there may be one or two more than that, but anyhow, that's set. And then they said, we want you to do these super versions for the Atom. Well, that sounded pretty good, and we, boy, we could do lots more graphics. And our, I'll tell you, Super Zaxxon was so nice. Um, we had all sorts of stuff we added on. Um, so they have them. Now, there is an Achilles heel in this project, unfortunately. And that is that you need some kind of a mass storage for it. The other guys use floppy drives, five and a quarter inch floppy drives, with not very high density floppy disks, but gee, you can get 160K of memory onto one floppy disk if you're an Apple user. And they built the floppy drive to go with the Atom, but that was going to be an add-on, because that would cost you another 500 bucks. And what they planned on using was a technology that had been wandering around looking for somebody to please buy it called the Stringy Floppy. Now, many of you have never seen an 8-track. But um, in an 8-track, you have a continuous tape that's wrapped around and around and around the spindle inside it. And one end of the tape is pulled up from the, from the in, innermost layer on that wrapping pulled up and over the top and out through one end of the case. It goes over some rollers and stuff, and then it comes back in and is connected to the tape that's on the outside. And as the drive turns the tape and it pulls more tape off, it makes the tape, whole mass of tape inside spin. And the outside spins faster than the inside. So by all logic, it ought to gradually tighten itself further and further until it's seized completely up. And it only works because they have really low friction between the tape. Mm. So that you're pulling this end and the thing is turning and it can't really turn fast enough so everything outside of it just slips backwards as it goes and it keeps moving out. It's a one directional tape and you've got to play all the way through to get back to the beginning again. But that's fine if you've got Barry Manilow <laughs> or something on your tape and you want to plug it in the dash of your 70 Firebird and listen to the music, right? As a data system, it leaves something to be desired. Having a, a non-random access storage device that you have to start at the beginning and play all the way through back to the beginning again before you can get to the next thing on the tape is not cool. But the stringy floppy was the same thing with one millimeter wide tape instead of, instead of uh, quarter inch tape. So everything's reduced by enormous factor. And the little cartridges are only like that square and maybe this thick. Um, and they're really cheap to make much cheaper than those plug-in 24K memory cartridges that you had on the ColecoVision. So there's very attractive to the guys who are thinking about selling lots and lots and lots of games because the profit margins would be way bigger mm -hmm. on that $10 game that you buy. The cartridge ones for the ColecoVision, I think they were costing them like five bucks a piece to make. So when you take out discounts for retailers and stuff, there isn't much profit margin per game. Make them for 
25 cents a piece and sell them for 10 bucks and then you're much happier. Um, so that's the memory they're going to use. Now, when they asked their engineers, the engineers said, stringy floppy, they never got that thing to work right. The people who own the patents on stringy floppy are insisting they've solved the problems. Now they'll work okay this time. Mm -hmm. And Coleco bets on it. And Coleco has the atom. And all the other stuff is coming together fine. New disk drives are working okay. They got all this stuff, but the stringy floppies just keep eating themselves classic thing on an 8-track tape was you played it just so many times and then all of a sudden there was a terrible squealing sound as the friction got too high and everything seized up and it broke the tape and the leftover tape spilled all over inside your your player and got wrapped around all the moving parts. No it was very really manalo. fun. <laughs> yes, very nanolo <laughs> suddenly gets replaced with a shriek. And, and then you have to just kind of take apart your dash which in the 1970s was no problem. There was just mm -hmm. one bolt, right? And then so many people getting them, getting their eight tracks stolen out of their cars that 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 Detroit re-engineered and taking your dash apart to get your eight track out to fix it is an all afternoon experience with seven different sizes of screwdriver and socket wrench. It's just tedious as all hell. Anyhow, um, they had they had uh, this problem and it wasn't working, it wasn't working. And they, they went for a lot of time before they finally concluded that they were going to, to drop that idea and put in something else. At this point, the group that are making the disk drives said, well, we'll just use the disk drives then. But we're gonna lose money on every copy of a Sullivan 600 with a $500 disk drive. No, no, we're, we're gonna have to reprice it. We're gonna have to put it up to like about 1100 maybe a thousand dollars oh we already advertised it's going to be 600. now at that point they could have bit the bullet and said um well i'm glad none of you people out there who buy the stuff from us to put in the stores have bought them yet because we have to we have to admit that we messed this whole thing up and they're going to be 1100 dollars a piece they're still cheaper than what the guys at apple are selling for half the price of doing it with an apple and we don't know what AVM's gonna sell for, but they're not cheap either. So, you know, we'll be competitive. Unfortunately, they decided that they were gonna find a cheap way to substitute for the cheap drive. So they came up with another system that was not bright, which had been done by some people previously. You have a standard audio tape cassette. Again, many of you have never seen one, but in any case, Standard audio tape. In most other computer systems, you plugged it into a standard tape, tape player, um, and you fiddled around with the uh, volume and the tone controls in your tape players until your computer liked the sound. And then you just plugged it in and it played, and it played from the beginning to the end of whatever you were downloading into your computer. And when you were done with that, you hit the rewind button, put it back at the beginning for the next time you're going to use it, and put it to one side and didn't use it again. You just played everything internally on the computer. Um, and again, these were largely being replaced by floppy disk drives that you could read and write from all the time with everything else. Every serious computer program was doing that. But guys who just wanted to play games, they were still mm -hmm. working. <coughs> Coleco decided it was going to come up with, a, 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 with another one of those marginal idea things you would have tapes that were pre-recorded that had a marker channel on it. You would have a read head that's in contact with that all the time. And as you fast forward the tape past the, cha past the read head, it knows where on the tape it is because of what the last signal that went past was. Mm -hmm. And you then have computer controlled fast forward and rewind. And it becomes possible for you to do on your little tape cassette what you see them doing on those old 1950s and 60s movies of the giant powerful computer that's taking over the world. They have great big reels of tape that spin back and forth and go zoop, 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 zoop from one to the other, right? And that's the way IBM computers work, or actually Unix, uh, uh, Unix, Unix is wrong. Um, I've just gone around. Sperry, Unisys? computers did. Um, the IBM eventually got to doing that too, but and it gives big reels of tape that you put all your mm. data on, right? Well, now you're going to make a micro version of that using a standard audio tape cassette that, well, isn't really engineered to be abruptly reversed when it's going at top speed in one direction and suddenly goes back the other way. There's a lot of wear and tear there. But that will be the plan, but you have to have special pre-formatted ones. Um, 
and you'll have to buy those from Coleco because heaven forbid that you should just go down to your local Radio Shack store and buy two dozen of them at 25 cents a piece and use the copy feature to just copy mm -hmm. all those games you just bought one of from Coleco onto 20 copies for all of your buddies, the which is yeah. certainly possible with mm -hmm. that, right? Um, and so they arranged that it would be impossible for you to do that. And why would it be impossible to do that? Because there's an extra hole in the case and there's a little feeler that in, goes through that hole when you, when you close, the draw, close the drive lid and if it can't go through that hole, it knows you don't have a real Coleco tape and it won't work. Or if anything went wrong and it didn't go through there properly, you've got a perfectly good tape, but it's sure you're lying. <laughs> um, anyhow, this system is going to be used because it's marginally cheaper than giving you the disk drive they've already got all the bugs out of. More time goes past while they try to wring out the problems with this system and it's not working so good. And more and more of their engineering time is the clock ticks through the summer before. In August, they have to start delivering these things to the stores that are going to sell them for Christmas. By August, they are desperately short of time and they haven't got all the bugs out of the machine. And their buyers are getting very antsy about when are you gonna start shipping those. To make it worse, Apple and IBM have both announced that they're not going to get their new stuff out in time for Christmas. So there's a whole extra year to work on things in. All Coleco has to do is stand up and say, look, fellas, we're sorry, big teething problems. Just like Apple and IBM, we got a problem and we're going to postpone it until Christmas next year. Their various buyers might be a little miffed, but yeah, well, well, we're no worse than Apple or IBM. I mean, really, it is coming, mm -hmm. guys, right? Cost overruns, a little time problem, but we'll be there, right? In fact, they've even waited to see what the Apple system was actually going to cost, and then said, oh, look at that, it's $3,200, and ours has to go up too, it's gonna be 1200, mm -hmm. right? But no, no, they just stuck it out, led with their chins, insisted they're gonna make it, swore and promised on the blood of their, of their firstborn that they were gonna deliver on schedule. Comes August, they have a factory that's still waiting the go-ahead signal because there's mass minute modification being made every time they turn around. And they say, gotta have it, gotta have it to ship it, that's it. So they put them into production. And they just crank up as fast as they can. And the easiest way to get massive output is stop doing quality control. <laughs> <laughs> and so they fill all these orders. They fill up all these warehouses with all this product for the Christmas season that's been slapped together as fast as possible with overworked staff in factories with un not entirely tested designs and no quality control. Oh, we're asking for it. Yeah. What could they, possibly go wrong? What can possibly go wrong? <laughs> yes. So they got them out there, and they got them to the uh, they got them to the stores, and the stores are really happy, and um, they're all in the warehouses, and they're all set. And right before Christmas, you know, they have the big all night stocking exercise, and they put all this fabulous new great big blue box that's about that wide by that thick by that high it, you really know you're buying something valuable when you get a box that big and it's hard to pick up right and it's not just air in there right <laughs> they got them all set up and there is a stampede into the stores to buy these i mean this is just a wondrous gift and if you got a good one they are really nice i have one <laughs> i had an inside track i got a good one um anyhow they're a really nice computer. Yeah, it prints kind of slow, and by, ninth, by 2016 standards, it's a kind of a dumb little computer, but it plays all the games. Still got all the game cartridges. Um, and they got it ready. They hit the market, and that's when they found out that they had an enormous infant mortality rate on those. I mean, you know, the infant mortality rate is when it fails right out of the box, right? Um, they had a 50% failure rate. Now, a 5% failure rate would be bad news because all the stores be coming back to you and saying, you know how often people come back to me and they say this thing you just told me doesn't work? I'm getting really tired of this. But you can cover it by saying you're absolutely right, really sorry, you got some bad ones there. We, we know we had a bad batch that came out somewhere in there. We're tracking it down, right? You can lie like hell, but you can make it look plausible. Right. 
However, when the salesman turns around, because of course none of these salesmen know anything about fixing a computer. These are toy, Toys R Us people. Yeah, exactly. And so they turn around to the shelf and this, I'm really sorry ma'am, I'll tell you what, here, you pull another one right off the shelf, you hand her one, still in the original box, you take the bad one in the back and you write send back on top of it with a felt tip marker or something, right? She takes the new one home, she unpacks it for little Johnny and it doesn't work either. With 50% failure rate, you have a 50% likelihood that the replacement fails as well and it keeps on going and going. The gift that keeps on giving, you are dragged <laughs> through the, the mud. Store, huh? Right. <laughs> so all these stores are just outraged. And their response to Coleco was saying, well, look, look, we're working out. We know there's a problem. We're, we're going to fix it. Honest to gosh, no, no. Their response is, we'll never darken our doorsteps again. And this is really bad because it isn't just computer stores that won't take their Atom computers. It's stores that sell all of their other products from backyard dart sets and, and waiting pools and all the other things that their company is known for are getting tired of the same brush. Now they are in big trouble with their customer base, which are not individual stores, but big chains. Most of their stuff went out indirectly through big chain stores, right? And there's the, the, the main bulk of their market is just vanishing. They're working furiously trying to fix all the problems on the Atom. And the basic conclusion is, yeah, you really kind of just got to sell them a tape drive to, or a, a floppy disk drive to, to go with it, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. Should have used the floppy disk all along, right? right? By the next Christmas, they've got the bugs out of it, but almost no one's willing to try it again. And they're in deep trouble. And then the Cabbage Patch kids come out. They had, one of their buyers had seen a great opportunity and had bought the Cabbage Patch, writes the Cabbage Patch dolls. And they just go nuts. Cabbage Patch dolls are the ultimate product that next Christmas. And there's all these buyers that come trooping back to the doorstep at, at Coleco and come in and say, we want to get your Cabbage Patch dolls. And instead of saying, oh yeah, sure, we have you to sell your Cabbage Patch dolls and you're going to take, uh, you're going to take our swing sets and that kind of stuff too, aren't you? And please, and they go, all right, fine, you'll let you out of the cabbage, you know, mm -hmm. right? No, no, the response is, you were never going to talk to us again. You didn't like our Adam computers. What makes you think we'll let you have our Cabbage Patch dolls? Mm -hmm. Well, you've got you to gotta sell our Adam computers if you're going to take our Cabbage Patch dolls. You know, just let's burn any possible good relations. So they give these guys a lot of grief. And the buyers grip their teeth and submit the humiliation involved in buying the Cabbage Patch dolls and putting the stinking Atom computers back on their shelves again. And some of the Atom computers that are now repaired do sell with the add-on disk drive and more expense, right? And disk drives sell pretty well to all the poor devils who've got the Atom computers don't have them. But, you know, they go through that and for two years Coleco was kept alive by the Cabbage Patch dolls. And then that fad is over, and Coleco is dead. All the marketing people that they have pissed off by their shoddy treatment and their thing with the Atom, they, are, they will never darken their doorstep again unless there's a new phenomena that they managed to miraculously corner, which they didn't. Mm. We are well on the way to making all these cool games for the Atom computer, right? And suddenly, Coleco stops answering the phone and their checks stop coming. And we have all of our day-to-day -day expenses in our company and mostly we were losing money on them by that point anyhow and waiting for that first royalty check to come through. And the first royalty checks never arrive. And we can't get blood out of a turnip. They are dead and that's it. And we got just steamrolled by that because we were, our little company was heavily committed. We hired more people. We have more space that we're renting. We're working day and night and racking up money that we owe people in wages and they ain't no money coming in to pay them with. So we got hammered on that exercise. And uh, Coleco died. It's the reverse of the usual thing, you know. They, they got the bubonic plague and, and, and we got ordinary pneumonia. It was like, <laughs> 
So we were, um, we, we basically barely survived, but we got really nailed on it. And that was not quite the last time we worked on a game project. We tried a few more times to do games. Um, long and complicated story if I keep on going into that. But on that immediate moment, we realized that bad businessmen that we were. We'd been approached by Sega to do games for Sega mm -hmm. and games for Nintendo for their competing products. And our president, Mr. Nicholson, felt it would be dishonorable for us to work for the competition. Hmm. So instead of covering our bets by diversifying and having some guys in the company working for one company and some working for others and erect something of a wall of silence between us so we don't give away secrets. No, we just honorably didn't work for anybody else and then when Coleco goes away, we're high and dry. Um, and while we did a little work, we did a really cool game called Aztec Empire of Blood uh, for uh, Microprose. Mm -hmm. And Microprose hit a little uh, financial difficulty and after advertising it in magazines that it was coming, they dropped the project. So once again, we didn't get any royalty income off of that one either. What kind of game was that one? Oh, it was a, it was a, uh, a reminiscent of Civilization. Okay. You've, seen, you've seen Sid Meier's Civilization, right? It was this sort of thing. You are an Aztec emperor, one of 15 Aztec emperors. And you are given a map of the Aztec empire at the time he acceded to the throne. And you have your uncle or cousin or nephew or whatever he was in that particular role, another member of the royal family, in any case, who was the high priest. And he will come to you and tell you how you have to capture more captives and, and have more blood sacrifices to the gods of the Aztecs. I mean, it's empire of blood for a reason, right? Um, and, and maybe actually come and suggest to you that the protein levels in the diet of the people are too low and you have to have a bunch of captives they can eat. Um, but in any case, it's pretty gruesome, right? Um, and then you have ambassadors from all of the other tributary tribes that are sub subjugated by you and ambassadors from all the places you haven't subjugated yet in the, in the Valley of Mexico. And you can then embark upon a campaign of conquest or you can set up what's called a flower war where your young men and theirs go out and fight each other for the glory and honor of fighting. It's like a really big, very violent football game. And the losers get hauled off and sacrificed. Uh, but that satisfies the need. And it doesn't produce long-lasting resentment on the part of the other guys, right? Because your casualties got hauled off and sacrificed in their temples, right? It's kind of grim, but there you are. In any case, and you had a whole bunch of things you had that you could, like decisions that you could make. But one of the things that was worked into it by the guys who were designing it um, uh, which was uh, Dave Arneson and Ken Fletcher and several of the other people, was the, the real structure of Aztec society and the fact that, yes, you're the god emperor, you know, and, and, and supposedly you can do no wrong except that the high priest kind of has his, his own agenda and he expects you to adhere to the proper articles of the faith and mm -hmm. so on. And so within reason you can do some stuff. Um, you pick out who's going to be the generals of your different commands, right? And Aztec society says that, of course, seniority is almost everything. So you can have a bunch of old fuds who aren't really much use, but you've got to put them in the top slots. To some degree, you can, you can violate that by moving somebody up higher than he ought to be or putting somebody down lower. And within some limits, not clearly defined to you, you get away with that. But if you're just too exotic and quixotic and don't follow the structures of the society, the gods become displeased. Hmm. And your probability of winning in any battles that are fought goes down noticeably. And the harvest may not go off too well if the gods don't like you, and so on. So this was going to be the undercurrent of the thing. It's a role-playing game where there's, unlike in civilization, you actually have some stuff you you, you can't just ca calculate with great precision exactly how close to the edge you can ride on a given thing and get away with it. There is no attitude advisor that you can check to see which city is about to go up and revolt, mm -hmm. right? So there was, that was the kind of things you did. And at least two of the emperors get to play with these, these guys from Spain who show up, you know, it's their problem, big problem. So, but it was, it was quite, a, quite a well thought out game. And one of the remarkable things 
that came out of it just before it ended. I got a pair of 3D goggles, you know, these cheap cardboard things with little plastic windows you look through, oh, they sure, put yeah. on like glasses. Okay. I got a pair of these in the mail along with a little comic book that ad was there to advertise the neat new goggle technology. And being a kid from the 50s, I was seen that one in the 1950s, you know, blue eye and a red eye and red and blue printing in the comic book, and, you know, big deal. Well, I looked at these and they both seemed to be the same color, which seemed a little odd. And then I looked at their 3D comics and they weren't two obvious separate line drawing color images, they were photographic kind of pictures. Hmm. I put them on and holy mackerel, they're three dimensional. This is really a breakthrough on how do you do this, right? Well, I was pretty impressed, and they went out some length about how you could use these for your products, and you could get this great new three-dimensional effect in your ads and so on, right? And I'm going, yeah, that, that would be neat. I'm not an advertising guy, but that'd be neat. And then I happened to put them on while looking at the console with our Aztec Empire of Blood opening sequence with the eagle flying over the Valley of Mexico and eventually landing on top of a pyramid, okay? Mm -hmm. Nice graphic introduction thing and it was all in 3D. And we hadn't even known we were drawing it in 3D. That's when I looked into how the goggles worked and I was really impressed. And I, here we are, and the guys at the other end are, are gonna cancel the project. And so I, I was all set. I was gonna fire it off to them and say, fellas, listen, look, at, we're drawing this game for you in 3D. Nobody has 3D video games, right? And um, send them the goggles and tell them look at the opening credits and see if that didn't re rearrange your thinking, but it was too late. They canceled. Shame. So there you are. It was amazing. And it wasn't like we invented the technology. We just fell on it, right? That would have been wonderful. I've never seen anybody use it. It's spectacular, though, really. Um, but I won't go into oh, I could. I probably could tell you how it works, but shall I? <laughs> uh, technical. Okay. Basically, the two goggles you've got are diffraction gratings. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on the wavelength of light that strikes them, it, it's like a prism. It spreads it out to each side. Hmm. Um, the result is that if you have a flat surface, objects that are blue or deep blue are brought in and they are deflected not as much as objects that are red are. Hmm. It's a very small angular deflection difference between the two eyes. But when your mind sees it, it analyzes this as the red thing is closer than the blue thing. And other colors all the way through the spectrum just graduate their way in. So if the thing up in the front is red, it's really close to you. And if it is blue, it's far away. And if it's, if it's orange, then yellow, then green, and then blue. And you, all the different shades in between are shades of distance. And we happen to have picked a golden eagle flying over the blue pre-dawn, the purple pre-dawn countryside, right? And the golden temple that's rising up, it's sticking up into the, into the rising sun that he lands on is therefore about the same height he is, so he flies in, he lands on. And we hadn't planned it that way, but it worked like a charm. And in an awful lot of places, the reasonable set of colors, if you're underwater, things in the distance would be dark blue. Things close up, that bluish color would go away and you get to see you get to see the fish that's up close and it's natural red and white colors. Mm -hmm. And as it goes away from you, gradually add blue tint to that as there's more and more water and he gets further away. It's just stunning. What happened to these it's guys, wonderful, it? yeah. Now, engineering it, take quite a lot of artistic practice to get that to work. Oh, speaking of the artistic practice, let me talk to you about Paul Jaquais. Mm -hmm. um, Paul was the artistic director on the video game things at Coleco. And I really didn't know him. I knew there was a Mr. J. Quays had his office in the hall, right? We were working with a couple of the artists from his department. And we had broken with convention in many ways. They were a very 19th century hierarchical company. Hmm. If you had some art you needed done, the art department is supposed to do it for you. They're mostly there to make box art and ads and stuff. Hmm. We're doing this thing with lots of graphics in Zaxxon, right? 
So we need people to make us pictures of little rocket fighters and blowing up fuel tanks and gun turrets and everything. That's the theory, right? So we're supposed to request artistic support from the art department. The art department will then, the director will tell, the sub-director will tell the, the supervisor, da, 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 down the chain of command, a couple of artists with drawing boards and everything in their end of the building will be handed all these screen captures from the, from the, from the Nintendo game. Mm -hmm. And they will sit there hour after hour doing drawings from them of cool looking stuff that should appear in the game. And then they will send them up their chain of command to be reviewed by each of the people over them, above them and approved and then passed over at the vice presidential level or the director level to somebody in the electronic game department and then they'll be run down the chain of command to us with approved stamp on each one and here, use these, right? Never mind that the number of colors available and the fifth spriting problems and all the other digital stuff mm -hmm. will make those pictures impossible to do. Well, the first time we got into this, we said, well, who did these? Oh, okay, so we walked down the hall, went straight in the art department, found the two guys at the drafting board, started talking to them about their artwork. And they're looking kind of nervous because they ain't supposed to work that way. Hmm. You're supposed to take orders from your bosses and their bosses, not coordinate and change things for some other nobody at the bottom of the pyramid, right? So we worked with them a bit and we said, come on, I'll show you how the graphics art works so and so on. You know, they don't know about this, right? But we are the whiz kids from Minnesota working on the super game, which is now animating properly, right? So we're already attaining um, exempted status. So we violated the sacred rules of hierarchies and got these guys in and trained them on how to do computer graphic art. And they could both see that this is a wave of the future, mm -hmm. that art guys really ought to want to learn. And yes, but the people who employ you might not want you to learn that skill, you know, because you're worth more now when you go to work somewhere else. Mm -hmm. In any case, we got these two artists working with us and we're doing graphics and stuff. And we've already got Eric Bromley from on high has approved this irregular procedure, right? So we're, we're covered. We're near the end of the project and we have it up and running in prototype form and we like it a lot because it all moves smoothly and when you fire the little green blasts they go up there and they go bam like they're supposed to, you know, everything's worked good. And then Paul Jakeways comes down the aisle from his office, the art director, and he says, well let me see what you guys got here and he looks at it all. Now, I know when he was the art director, I didn't make any other connection in my mind at the time. And he sat down and he looked at it and he said, yeah, but you know, you guys could make that a lot better. And he sits down at the keyboard with access to the bit bashing, right? Mm -hmm. And starts tweaking and fiddling. And I'm going, what the hell does he know about this, right? And in three hours, all the little objects that scroll past you have nice little shadows and highlights. Oh. And they all look really a lot better. And the two art, the two art guys that are with him there are going, yeah, yeah, well, we, we thought we couldn't do that. They didn't tell us we could do that, right? And so he's, he's making the thing look beautiful. It was just amazing. I'm thinking, holy mackerel, he's got artistic skill coming out of his fingertips. He's not just some guy who graduated high in his class at, uh, at Harvard and got a job in a management position here. He, he really is a, an artist, right? And it was then that I realized that he was the Paul Jakeways who did all those neat covers for the Dragon magazine and Dungeons and Dragons posters and stuff that I've been seeing at Gen Cons. Hadn't made the name connection at all, right? So he's, he's really a name artist already, thank you, right? Which is probably why Eric Bromley or somebody recruited him for this stuff. The artistic talent. Well, that's not a bad thing to recruit your art director for, you know. Um, <laughs> But it was, a, it was a shock then to find that out. And then from that time, of course, I did know him. I got to see him at Gen Con from time to time, right? So he was, he was a figure who was around. He was connected with TSR, and I was a doctor in TSR, but I'd never put two and two together to figure that out, right? And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, should be back next week with the final installment of this interview with Major Wesley. 
Then after that, I'll probably be reviewing something, so I uh, haven't quite picked out what I want to do. Lots of uh, stuff on the table, a lot of requests uh, for uh, things for me to review. Uh, just let me know what you would like to see on the show, and I will definitely consider that. Uh, as always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you very, very, very much for your support of the show. Could not do this without you. <laughs> definitely depend on you uh, to help people uh, learn about the show, uh, as well as supporting it financially. Uh, so if you want to do your part, just go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. All I ask is one buck per show. <laughs> Keep these episodes coming. Uh, you can also support uh, support the show by uh, going to goodoldgames.com using my affiliate link in the show notes or at mattchat.us. Uh, that's a way to support the show just by buying games, and it doesn't cost you anything extra uh, at all for that. As long as you're using that affiliate link, I'll get a small uh, kick back on that, so uh, <laughs> consider that too. Uh, anyway, I thank you for all of your uh, support for the show. Really, really appreciate it. All right, what about that news for the Mad King? All right, let's see here. Uh, Stig wrote in about this. This is a Planescape Torment Enhanced Edition. Uh, this is coming out on April 11th. It's by Beamdog. They got uh, Chris Avalon on there as a, uh, I guess, some kind of consultant. He's a, a curator, as they say here. Curating gameplay updates, bug fixes, and enhancements. They've redone the music, uh, remastered it, that is. They've got a 4K interface, area zooming, tab highlighting, uh, lots of goodies. Uh, I know there's been some people are concerned about the change in uh, graphic style, I suppose, but they say here that you can turn all that off or turn off all the features if you like. It's just up to you. Uh, and that's available for pre-order right now, $19.99 on uh, GOG. And uh, once again, use my affiliate link if you don't mind, if you want to pick that up. Uh, other big news, uh, Thimbleweed Park is now out and about. A lot of you guys probably supported it on Kickstarter when they were doing their uh, Kickstarter campaign. But if you missed out on it then, don't worry. It's, it's also $19.99 on GOG. Uh, if you're just now hearing about this this game, uh, <laughs> I guess you don't watch the show very much. Uh, anyway, that's it's done by Ron Gilbert, Gary Winnick. Uh, those are the, the guys that worked on the Maniac Mansion, Monkey Island. Uh, basically, uh, Lucasfilm's uh, point-and-click adventure games, fantastic games, uh, by the way. I'm sure you probably played those. Uh, this one is, uh, let's see, how do they describe this? A haunted hotel, an abandoned circus, a burnt-out pillow factory, a dead body pixelating under the bridge, toilets that run on vacuum tubes. You've never visited a place like this before. Five people with nothing in common have been drawn to this run-down, forgotten town. They don't know it yet, but they are all deeply connected, and they're being watched. So, uh, it looks like a lot of fun. I have to admit I haven't had a chance to play this one yet, but... Uh, if you have, uh, please let me know what you think, but don't spoil anything, please. And then, uh, I guess the last bit of news, the Mass Effect Andromeda came out a couple weeks ago. I've actually been spending some time with that one. I've always been a big fan of that series. Uh, this one does have a couple of problems, at least uh, from my point of view. Uh, they've kind of limited what you can do with your squad mates in terms of their loadouts and uh, controlling them, but I'm really liking the storyline so far. The characters are all fun as always, so... Uh, I'll let you know more if, as I uh, play it more and have more opinions about it. But uh, just right now, I think it's a, I'm having a lot of fun with it. So i uh, just leave it at that. Uh, I'd like to hear your opinion as well. All right, I think that'll do it for the news. Uh, what about that ale of the week? Oh, wow. <laughs> what do we have here? We have a Clown Shoes Space Cake Double IPA. That's India Pale Ale for all of you who only drink soda pop. Uh, let's see. Nice little write-up. This is quite an interesting label here. I'll make sure to show that label to you up close. And I do believe there is a some <laughs> superhero of some sort there with his... And what is that, a dog? Yes, it's a dog. <laughs> Why are Miracle Mike and his dog Bionic being chased by evil laser beam shooting cupcakes and two giant layer cake motherships? Ask myself that on every day. Uh, well, because we're straight-up lunatic fools. 
Well, maybe, but with a few brain cells remaining, <laughs> uh, we managed to craft a Space Cake Double IPA utilizing citrusy mosaic hops and an immaculate West Coast style malt backbone. Dude, dude chill out. <laughs> I feel like I'm drunk already just reading the label on this thing. Uh, Clown Shoes Beer. Uh, these guys are out of Ipswich, Massachusetts. Uh, alcohol 9% by volume, so they're not uh, playing around there uh, either. But uh, I just, I love the, it's just fantastic artwork on this bottle. If, they're, if the beer is anywhere close uh, to being the same level as their uh, label design and the text on the bottle, this will be a real treat. Uh, so anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this uh, Space Cake Double IPA. I know I always do this for my drinking horn, but uh, for some reason, uh, when I tried it with my horn this time, it smelled kind of like a soap. <laughs> so I'm thinking maybe uh, last time I washed this thing out, it didn't get all the soap out. Uh, once I transferred it to a glass, though, uh, there's no soap aroma, uh, which is a good thing, right? So uh, let's just do the glass this time, if you don't mind. Uh, smelling this, it smells really good. You definitely smell the hops in there. That's really about all you smell. Uh, definitely very hoppy, uh, which is exactly what you want in a double IPA, I would hope. <laughs> Otherwise, you probably want a different style. Uh, let's give it a taste, though. Mm. Oh, this one's definitely uh, very flavorful uh, right away. You can tell this is, isn't messing around at all. Uh, you get that sort of strong hoppy punch, but not with uh, very much uh, bitterness. You know, sometimes these IPAs can be very, very bitter. And some people like that. Uh, I tend to like the bitterness just enough to kind of cancel out uh, the sort of alcohol uh, flavor. And this one just really nails that. Let me try it again here. Yeah, really good flavor on this. It's kind of subtle. I don't know what, what a birthday or what a cake has to do with it. <laughs> it doesn't taste sweet uh, to me. It's just kind of hoppy, a little bit maybe of a... Oh, what is that? Maybe just a little bit of a... Yeah, let me try it one more time. I don't know how to describe this. There's sort of another flavor in there I can't put my finger on. <laughs> you know, I need to expand my vocabulary a little bit when it comes to these, but... Um, I guess I would call that kind of a, a raisiny, currant-like flavor. Uh, very subtle, though. Mostly what you taste is the hops. Uh, anyway, I think this is a really, really good choice here. I'm uh, really enjoying this. If uh, you like IPAs, I don't know why you wouldn't like this. A very, very uh, solid choice. I'm going to go a full five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, space Cake Double IPA. Really good flavor. Uh, they, they nailed the, just the right amount of bitterness. Uh, just the right amount. <laughs> Actually, like a lot of hoppy hoppiness there, so that it delivers. So a five out of five for the Space Cake Double IPA. So I was looking uh, for quotes about reputations. That uh, seems to be the theme of uh, this week's episode, right? And I came across this one by Benjamin Franklin, a man known uh, for the occasional quote, right? Uh, and it goes something like this. It takes many good deeds to build a good reputation, and only one bad one to lose it. So ponder that, and see you guys next week. Decent fellow. I hate to kill him. You seem a decent fellow. I hate to die. <laughs>